Good afternoon and welcome to the Midday News. Here's what we have in the bulletin. Infant victim in St. Anne deadly crash transferred to a corporate area facility. Double murder rocks Williamsfield District, St. Elizabeth. And later in sports, reggae boys move two places in latest FIFA World Rankings. Thank you for joining us. I'm Shane Masters and here are the details. Three people have succumbed to their injuries following a multiple vehicle collision in Otria St. Anne last night. This brings to four the number of people who have died in motor vehicle crashes in the parish in less than a week, Shamala Pullen reports. Police flashing blue lights, firefighters moving with urgency. This was a scene of a deadly multiple vehicle collision in the vicinity of Pearly Beach, Otria St. Anne Wednesday night. Debris scattered the roadway. The vehicles involved, a grey Honda Fit motor car, black Nissan motor car, white Nissan AD wagon motor car, and a white Range Rover Sports, mangled almost beyond recognition. The incident happened at about 8.30. According to police reports, three vehicles were traveling in an easterly direction along the Duns River Main Road in St. Anne. On reaching the vicinity of Pearly Beach, the driver of the White Range Rover, which was proceeding towards the direction of St. Anne's Bay, failed to keep left, causing a collision. The crash victims were rushed to the St. Anne's Bay Hospital, where the driver and passengers traveling in the Nissan and AD wagon were pronounced dead. They have been identified as 41-year-old Robert Muir, a vendor of Thompson Penn St. Catherine, 55-year-old Christopher Charles White, also a vendor, and 42-year-old Kareem Browning of Thompson Penn St. Catherine. An infant who was a passenger in the Range Rover was treated at the St. Anne's Bay Hospital and transferred to another health facility for further treatment. A sign among the rubble indicates the area is a 50 kilometer zone, but according to one eyewitness. What's going on on the road is very crazy. And one of the main thing what I observe from my driver too, it's impatient. The driver them not have no patient at all. And that's what causing most of the accident. That's my speech. For I observe a lot, nobody don't want to wait. And as soon as they see a little space where they can overtake, they don't care. Even around corner, I observe a lot of drivers even that overtake around corners. This is the second incident in less than a week in the parish. On Sunday, one person died and 23 others injured following a motor vehicle crash in Fern Gully. Some of those persons are still being treated at hospital. At least three are critical and were transferred to a Taipei health facility. Shamela Pullen, TVJ News. Meanwhile, the National Road Safety Council says it is seriously concerned about the most recent incidents. Vice Chairman of the National Road Safety Council, NRSC, Dr. Lucien Jones, says he has requested a meeting with Prime Minister Andrew Hornes on what is currently taking place on the nation's roads. Despite the gains we have made as a country in respect of having a new road traffic act and an improved ticketing system, some measure of public education through the media and other important steps that have been taken to reduce road fatalities in this country. Since the beginning of April, 10 people have died on our roads, 10 in four days. This is a major disaster and calamity. Dr. Jones is also calling on members of the Jamaica Constabulary Force, JCF, to increase their level of enforcement on the roads. We have to make sure that whatever is left with fixing the ticketing system in respect of people not paying their fines at the tax office, going to court, and then getting a summons if they fail to appear in court. Whatever is left in the system to be fixed. It needs to be fixed urgently. But all of this seems to be falling on deaf ears in our country as people continue to speed and drive recklessly. Which if you examine what has happened in the last four days carefully, is a common theme. 
A woman police constable from the Westmoreland Division is suffering from a broken leg following a crash this morning in St. Elizabeth. Another officer is in hospital. Reports are that the police vehicle which was transporting a prisoner was heading towards Santa Cruz. Now it's understood that the driver attempted to overtake another vehicle when he crashed into an embankment in the vicinity of Burn Savannah Crossing. Now the prisoner received minor injuries. The St. Elizabeth Police says it will not relent until the perpetrators in Wednesday night's double murder in the parish is caught and brought to books. As we hear in this report, a man and a woman were at a bar when gunmen approached them and fired several shots, killing them on the spot. Gunshots rang out last night in the peaceful community of Williamsfield in Sandal, St. Elizabeth, leaving two people dead. According to reports, men armed with guns went to the AC bar along Shantytown Lane, where a barrage of shots were fired and the two people killed, including the bartender. The hoodlums fled the scene in a Toyota Axio motor car. The deceased have been identified as 38-year-old Dane Morgan, otherwise called Little D of the community, and 21-year-old Kishen Arscott of a Ballads River Clarendon address. The attack, it's understood, took place around 10.30. Coolidge Minto is the acting superintendent in charge of the St. Elizabeth Police. The information we have so far, the female, the bartender that worked at this location, was her second day working here. The gentleman who was killed is a resident of this community. Well over 33 spank shells were found at this location. He says the requisite assistance will be provided to the community as residents come to grips with a gruesome act in the once peaceful community. And in fact, we have not had any major incidents in this community. And so we are here supporting the residents and ensuring that this investigation will be speedy and swiftly. The residents are not accustomed to this kind of activity in their space. And so we are ensuring that our CSS team, supported by our station pastors and chaplains, will provide support. The gentleman had a number of children, uh, many of them who are traumatized out of this incident, as well as children in this community. And so we'll be providing additional support to them. We will continue the investigation until we find the persons responsible for this gruesome killing of these two people. No motive has been established for the killings. The Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions, DPP, says rape and crimes against children are at an alarming high rate based on the cases fixed to be heard in the Home Circuit Court during the Easter term. 924 cases covering a wide range of crimes are fixed for trial and case management hearing during the next 18 weeks. 824 of those cases were brought over from the previous McMass term. Prince Moore has the details. According to data presented in court, there are 440 cases of sexual offenses on the list, while murders account for 339. Of the sex offenses, there are 189 cases of rape and 151 pertaining to having sexual intercourse with a person under 16. There are 35 new sexual offense cases on the list. Among these, 21 are rape charges, while there are 7 cases of sexual offense against a minor. In the meantime, Mrs. Martin Swaby is encouraging members of the public to resist shying away from jury duty. Mrs. Martin Swaby highlighted the importance of jurors and expressed gratitude to stakeholders who determine where justice lies in the courts. The prosecutor pointed out that most of the offenses are tried by jury. It is the right of a defendant to opt for a jury trial or for a judge alone trial. Mrs. Martin Swaby noted members of the public frequently cry out for justice in the wake of serious crimes being committed, but stressed the justice system requires their input in order to dispense justice. And it's time for a break here on the Midday News, but stay with us. More stories when we return. Welcome back to the Midday News. Transport groups will be meeting today to discuss short-term incentives to the transport operators steering committee. 
This after the groups agreed to a delay in the implementation of the 16% fare increase, which was scheduled to take effect on April 1. Speaking on Power 106's morning agenda on Thursday, President of the Transport Operators Development Sustainable Services, Todd's Editor Newman, says that there are certain issues that must be addressed first in order for the sector to run efficiently. Mr. Newman says an increase in tax affairs at this time is secondary. Let's look at a taxi man who will call Dian Chance and say, Dian, a seven ticket me get today, no? Because if we stop in Kingston, yellow line police after me. There's no parking facility. If we can address that, my brother, then we are way ahead of our game. If we can get that $200 million revolving loan from the nice said moved up to $500 million to assist Finnegan in buying spare parts for his car that is shimmering to the ground right now, we'll be at, at single digit, I shouldn't say single, that is a low and 5% five, 5 um, interest rate. We'll be way across our game right now. Meanwhile, President of the National Council of Taxi Association, Dion Chance, is reassuring its members that despite an agreement for delaying the fare increase, the groups will still be holding the government accountable in addressing issues affecting them. We are not easy nuts to crack. So, going forward, if, if we don't get things that can alleviate the pressure, come next year, and as I use Mr. Newman, we're ready to tell and put out. So, we are, we are going into negotiations to get better things. And these things will have to come in order for us and our members to be able to, to really see a return on our investment and be able to put something aside and not just live day to day. Because mm -hmm. the taxi men now are no different from the, the, the average person getting the minimum wage. Mm -hmm. We're living from day to day. It's now time for the Business Minute. The central bank says businesses expect inflation to be broadly stable for the next year. In its most recent MPC report, the BOJ says business inflation expectation for the year starting January should be about 8.3%. However, inflation is projected to remain above the central bank's 4.6% target range over the March 2024 to June 2025 quarters. The BOJ says the higher inflation projection is linked to the continuing impact of past and impending increases in public passenger vehicle fares. It says without the impact of the two increases in PPV fares, inflation would fall within the target range for most of 2024. The central bank says, however, that the risks to the inflation outlook are balanced. Further afield in the U.S., the largest producer and distributor of fresh eggs is experiencing a bird flu outbreak. Calmain Foods has temporarily stopped production at a facility in Texas. The state agriculture commissioner says the company has to depopulate 1.6 million lean hens and 337,000 pullets. Calmain says it is working to secure production at other plants to minimize disruption to its customers. Officials say the current risk to the public is minimal. Bird flu has also been detected at a poultry facility in Michigan. And that's it for the Business Minute. I'm Shamela Pullen. Time now for the top regional and international stories. In the region, President of Guyana, Dr. Irfan Ali, has warned the government of Venezuela that he will not tolerate any move to annex sections of its territory. The warning followed the activation of a legislation by President Nicolas Maduro to make Esequibo a new state in keeping with last December's referendum. Dr. Ali describes the attempt as a shocking violation. In light of the violation, Venezuela was put on notice. On the international scene, pressure is mounting on the UK government to suspend arms sales to Israel after seven aid workers were killed in an Israeli airstrike in Gaza. More than 600 legal experts have written to the Prime Minister saying exports must end because the UK risks breaking international law over a plausible risk of genocide in the enclave. US President Joe Biden is set to meet with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on Thursday, marking the first conversation since the deadly airstrike. And workers in Argentina took to the street to protest against President Javier Millet's plan to cut tens of thousands of public service jobs. 
The Argentine Prime Minister announced the dismissal of at least 70,000 employees, sparking outrage and mobilization from state workers and supporters. The layoffs occurred last week, just before the Easter holidays, and include employees in national offices located in the capital, Buenos Aires, as well as throughout the country. And those are the top regional and international stories. I'm Karian Simpson. And we head to a quick break. When we come back, Spencer Darlington will have your midday sports report.